I went to 10 schools in 12 grades, which it's a lot of schools. It's a lot of schools. And um, we moved around a lot in different houses. We were renters. We were lifelong renters, you know. So lifelong renters come with their own sort of obsessive moves. So my dad had the grass is always greener on the other side. Okay, so we're moving from place to place to place. And then my mom had the rental house is greener on the other side. So even within the same neighborhood, we could possibly shift homes. You know, so you had a little bit of that. What comes with it are good things and not so good things. But one of the good things that comes from it is that you meet a lot of people. Um, you're coming and going all of the time. And you have to find out how to be with people. If you're going to make friends, make friends quickly. You have to have some skills for doing this, you know. You have to face up to people. You have to, And being able to tell stories or talk, you know. You can't just be like the new kid who walks silently to your person's door, knocks, and doesn't say anything. You've got to have a shtick. So that really helped, you know, to like get some personality going. My sister had a journal, had a little diary. And she would write in it. And uh, I was kind of a copycat, you know, like a younger brother type. And so I would watch her, and I thought, dang, she's so good at that, you know. And then I thought, well, if I read it, you know, I'll probably be as smart as she is because she was always smarter than me. And so then uh, I did read. I read her diary. It was a terrible, unethical thing to do, but I was compelled. And so um, I read it, and it wasn't terribly interesting to me. I mean, I'm not trying to run my sister down, but it, it seemed to me that she was missing all the richness of life. Here we were moving from western Pennsylvania to Cape Hatteras, to Barbados, to St. Lucia, you know, to Miami, you know, lots going on. And all these neighborhoods we would live in, all these crazy characters, and none of that made the diary. And I thought, that's really peculiar, because the world I'm living with, in the end, it's really interesting. So I got a diary, and then I started like keeping notes, and then I started trying to set the diaries up in such a way that they would be, well, they would help me get started. You know, because that blank page, you know when you look at that blank page and you put that on the desk or open a diary, it's really hard. It's intimidating. It's begging you to improve upon it, and it's hard. Every time you put that pencil down, you've sort of sullied the page. So then I did this thing. First, I'm a reader. You know, I was a good reader. So I'd read Harriet the Spy. And Harriet the Spy had a diary, and she walked around the neighborhood spying on everyone. And I thought, that is the greatest job in the world. I want that job, spy, you know, because I was good at looking in windows. And so, um, so I went out, and I got a big sheet of paper, and I drew a spy map of my neighborhood. And then I started drawing, down, drawing where everything interesting happened, you know, the the low supervision family over here and, you know, my family and where my dog was eaten by an alligator in Florida and where the other one, you know, was hit by a car, where the third one dug a hole, ran around the house, fell in, broke his neck, we buried him in the hole he dug. And the little things like that, all that kind of stuff. And then I would write, you know, I would open it up, see that map, and knew right away that I could focus on those stories and write those stories. There came a time in, uh, in my life and we had talked about it a little bit with moving. It was 11th grade. I was going to school in uh, Plantation, Florida. It was pretty much a large football program with a small academic institution attached to the side like a tick. And so, you know, it wasn't going very well for me, I didn't think. You know, then my parents moved again, one more time. And they moved to Puerto Rico. So we all moved to Puerto Rico. So halfway through 11th grade, I moved to Puerto Rico, and I go to work for my dad, construction work. And he has me become an apprentice to an electrician. Somehow, the mechanics of uh, electricity never really fully seated themselves in my mind. So I was burning the head off of a pair of Klein side cutters about every day, you know, electrocuting myself nearly all the time. And I thought, you know what, I'm not really good at this. Not only that, it was hard work. And so um, right around the time that 12th grade was about to start, I thought, you know what, I ought to, I ought to go to 12th grade you know, and graduate like a normal kid. But we didn't have money for private school in Puerto Rico, and I don't speak Spanish enough to really go to a regular school. So then we decided I should just go back up to Florida. My dad had uh, arranged it with some people he knew for me to live with them. So I went up there. 
and I had a, um, I had a car. I bought a car, and uh, but then I had a lot of freedom too. And then I discovered uh, beer, and it just seemed like oh my god, you know, I could drink a lot of this. And then it was like oh my god, it would all come back, you know. And uh, so I think I kind of fell into a depression at that point when I look back on it and and I was just churning I was just churning it wasn't going forward wasn't going backward I was just sort of drinking myself into this kind of inchoate state you know finally the people kicked me out because I was just a wreck but it wasn't bad because then I moved into this little um, rooming house and you know how like in old tourist motels these little U-shaped motels you drive up to the door right in front of your room it was one of those called the King's Court and um, it was Davy Crockett's great great granddaughter ran it, and she showed me his wallet. And she was just great. She was a lovely, tough old lady, and she was very sweet to me. And then it was like a welfare situation, and it was me and you know a lot of other people that I'd never met, you know. And, and it was wonderful. And they had kids, and you know, I worked at a grocery store, and I'd bring home lots of dented cans and you know candy and stuff like that. So there was a culture going on there, and I, I really liked it. And then I realized, look at me. I'm in twelfth grade. I own my own car, I pay my own rent, I buy my own clothes, I'm running my own life, I'm making passing grades. I'm like an adult. This is good. I'm an adult. You know, and I had that great sense of accomplishment. My writing was, well, not very good. You know, it was erratic. You know how you get about three paragraphs into every idea, and then you go, no, that's not good. Next day, you get about three paragraphs into something. No, that's not good. You wake up in the middle of the night, you write something down scribbly, and it looks like seismic, you know, contortions on the paper. You drive down the street, and you're writing on, on the seat, on the seat of the car itself, writing, because you just were seized by an idea, that sort of thing. And that's what I was sort of pecked to death with, you know, like, like a flock of birds from Hitchcock had come over, and were just pecking on me with kind of creative ideas that I was never able to finish. I was supposed to go to University of Florida. Okay, so I drove up to University of Florida because we had no money. And it was $300 a semester, I think, at, at that time. It was nothing. So I drive up to University of Florida, and right away it looks vaguely like my high school, a large sports facility with an academic institution hanging off the side. And then I go for my interview, and uh, they give me a Gator football. They give me a, a Gator T-shirt. They give me um, a Gator, a rubber Gator to put on the antenna on my car, Gator decal, um, a Gator towel to swing around. And I realize I'm just being recruited to sit in the stands every Sunday and scream my lungs out for the Florida Gators. No pen, no little pad. No, nothing. Plus, you couldn't take a creative writing course until your junior year. And then they said this, and this is so, so silly. They said to me, and you can't have your car. And I was like, I love my car. I bought that car. I worked in a grocery store to buy this car. And it had a big engine in it. It was an Oldsmobile F85, and this thing could fly. I mean, I loved my car. And I walked out of there, and I said, I'm not coming here. You know, and as backward as maybe the decision making was, I think emotionally it was spot on. You know, because I would have just dried up like a raisin up there. So I thought I'll move to St. Croix. By then, my parents had moved from Puerto Rico to St. Croix. My dad had his own construction company. I thought I'll move to St. Croix. I'll work for my dad. I'll write novels at night. I read books. I can write books. So I go down there. I'm working for my dad in the sun every day. When you finish a day in the sun in the Caribbean, you aren't writing books at night. You know, you are horizontal, or you're sitting somewhere drinking more beer. And then I had this like little revelation where I looked ahead, just like two, three, four years ahead of me. Everybody that was like 22, 23, 24, they're cooked, they're burned out, they're, they've had it, they're shot. And I thought, oh, that's the path I'm taking. And, you know, you just have these little moments. You see them for a moment, and if you don't seize on them, you'll lose it. You'll lose the path of the goal that you want. So I thought, I've got to get out of here. And then that's when the trouble began. When I was down there, um, it's just to be honest about it, you know, there was some drug, drug use, you know, minor drug use, marijuana and uh, hashish, that sort of thing. 
Um, not very pervasive in my life, but it was there. And then uh, I was just right at that point where I knew I had to get off the island. I was broke. I was totally broke. I lived with my parents. I, I had no money to get off. I had no reason to think I could even work my way out of the, the hole I was in. And then suddenly, you know, this opportunity occurred. And I won't be naive about this at all. I mean, everything was straight up front. I met this guy, um, I think at a bar downtown. And, uh, you know, we were talking. He said, well, you seem like, you know, kind of a hip guy. I said, well, you know, it's a nice compliment. Yeah, I'm hip. And so he said, well, you know, I'm sort of looking for a guy that's open-minded like you. I said, well, you know, I'm very open-minded. And so uh, he said, well, he said, if you see a boat sail into the harbor with red sails, let me know. We lived up on a hill overlooking the harbor. And one day I looked out the window, this boat with red sails. I'm like, hmm, I'll go look that guy up. So I went back to the bar. There he is, you know. So I said, hey, that boat's here. He said, great. One thing leads to another. And so eventually he takes me out to the boat and they offer me this deal. They say, look, we've got 2,000 pounds of hashish, not on the boat, but buried on a desert island. We have a little bit on the boat. They've been selling it a little bit, trying to make some money because they're broke. And he said, uh, he said about himself, he said, I'm going to go to New York to sort of arrange some deals. He said, but we need somebody to help sail that boat. And he said, that's where you come in. So you'll stay on with the owner, and uh, you'll help sail the boat, and then we'll give you $10,000 in cash. Now, given the contrast of my life at that point, I thought $10,000, like I knew it was wrong. I mean, you know, you know it's wrong, but you're, you're ready to take the risk. So I thought $10,000. In like 1970, $10,000 is four years of private school. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's like real money in those days. And I thought, great, I'll take one month, I'll sail the boat up, I'll get the 10 grand in cash, and then, you know, victory is mine. I'll be able to do everything I want. So we got on the boat, and it was a very wonky ride. The guy, you know, sort of naked most of the time, and that was kind of weird. And he had a gun, that was sort of weird. I thought, God, if he shot me out here in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, nobody would know. And then, on top of it, um, we didn't know where we were going. It was, I, I said to him one day, I said, do you know where we're going? He said, he said, the United States is very large, and it's way over here somewhere, and if you just kind of travel in that general direction, you'll hit it. And we did. We hit New Jersey. And we ran aground, um, ran aground in a Coast Guard base in New Jersey, in Cape May. And I remember the Coast Guard came out, little boat came out, guy with the megaphone, everybody okay? I'm like, oh, everything's fine. You don't need to board the boat because we had hashish just stacked everywhere in all the staterooms. And then uh, finally we got to New York, and uh, I started selling it. They met up with that other guy from St. Croix. They started selling the hashish. Um, eventually I, I did get my money. And then um, everything went south from there. And then finally, the FBI and the customs people got involved. They'd been watching this boat. They'd been tracking the boat. The military had been tracking it with military surveillance planes. They knew everything about this deal. Coming, going, selling every step of the way. So suddenly, swoop, they came down. I'd gotten away with my money, but I found out about it. When I called home, called my dad. My dad just said, where the heck are you? I said, someplace. <laughs> he said, uh, I've got the FBI parked in the driveway. They're reading our mail. They've tapped our phone. What have you done? And I was like, oh, this did not work. He said, so I've got you an attorney. Go to New York. So I was in New York, got the attorney, went to court. You know, I pled out. You know, I thought, okay. You know, a kid, they'll just give me probation. They'll say, you know, this was just a really boneheaded thing you did. Please don't do it again. And I'll say, oh, most certainly I won't. But they didn't. They gave me six years in prison. I did not do all six years. I did about a year and a half. But nonetheless, you know, it was really quite a, an eye-popping experience for me to be sort of let off in handcuffs and then, you know, instantly sent into a prison. From that moment forward then you really have to think, what are you doing with 
your life, that little bit of a goal that you had a glimmer of as a kid and then you wanted to seize on as a teenager and then you kind of lose your way a little bit as a young adult and then you find yourself in prison. It's really hard to find any kind of glimmer of, of that goal again. So it was the reading in prison. It was a reading. Thank God they had a little library. And that's how I started to read, read my way through the library. I started to keep journals. And I started to just kind of practice, you know, what I was doing. And, of course, prison is great in one sense because everybody's got a story. At least they've got one, how they got there, you know. And so I would, you know, write those things down, you know, sort of in code because you wouldn't want anyone to think that you were writing about them because they would be suspicious that you were doing something, not writing literature, but, I don't know, turning them in in some sort of way. And so uh, I did that. And that kind of sustained me sustained me and then I got out and as soon as I got out then I went right to college got involved with a creative writing program and then literally published my first book two years after finally um, it kind of reached a point where you know I'd written all the uh, Rotten Ralph books a lot of them and a lot of other picture books I was writing uh, the Jack Henry series of short stories autobiographical short stories and um, I'd written Yes, I'd written the first Joey Pigza book because I wrote that in 1998 when I was living in Albuquerque. And then um, that was a National Book Award finalist. And then um, Loses Control, Joey Pigza Loses Control was a, a Newbery honor book. And I began to feel a little bit like I had armored up some, you know, like, okay, got a few bits of recognition. And you know it's a good story. You know the whole thing with the smuggling and the high school life, living by yourself and reading books. You know that's a, you know, every writer would know that that's a juicy story to tell. And so I thought, well, it's time to tell it. And also, there had been at that time several other sort of prison books that had come out that I'd read that, you know, kind of made me sniff them out and think, you know, it's just no, that's not quite as authentic as I think. So I thought, why let somebody else guess at it when it's, you know, it's my story? So, um, so then I wrote Hole in My Life, and I wrote it about as honestly as I possibly could because being a fiction writer, even with your own life, you feel like you could improve it in a retelling. And so, uh, so I was pretty spot on with that. And then that book went out, and then that book really received its own really solid audience, you know, of teens, of adults, and, you know, the book has continued to stay alive and, and still gets out there. And I do a lot of speaking in high schools. I go to prisons all the time and work with, uh, with young men in prisons, you know, because they have ed programs, education programs, and they have to read, so they have to read that book. And that's a good galvanizing book, you know, and then to come in and say, well, I was in your shoes, and I was in this situation, and here's what I did. And, you know, they all have to read the book in order for me to come in. And I go over it with them, and we have great discussions, incredible discussions. And, you know, you walk in and you think, oh, my God, you know, these are the guys you don't want to run into it, you know, in a dark alley with. And, no, these, these are, like, fairly scary-looking guys sometimes. Not all of them, but some of them. And they'll look at you and go, well, how did your mom feel when you went to prison? And you're thinking, that's not the question you thought that person was going to ask you. But they, you realize that, you know, we're all really deeply connected emotionally and we have a, so much more in common, regardless of our situations, in prison, out of prison, writing books, not writing books, that we have that commonality. And so it's great to really tap that. And, you know, and also for those guys, too, to think they have stories, they have an entry into writing as well and with reading. And, you know, to realize and witness that on the other side, you know, on the other side of the bars, there's a life that they can go ahead and pursue. And you don't have to be defined in a small way by the, by the mistakes you've made that you can, you know, carry forth and, and then expand the definition of who you are. So with me going to prison, that's a, you know, that's a very small chapter in my entire life. It's a good chapter. I like it, and I'm glad I did the book. But it's not the full definition of who I am. But for some of those guys, that is the definition. And now they've got to move on, too. And in a positive way, I hope. So I like being part of their world. And so talking about it is now just like, oh, talking about 
your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters and your dogs and cats. And, oh, by the way, I went to prison. It's a great line at a cocktail party. I speak in prisons, and I do a lot of public library speaking and high school speaking as well. And a lot of times, I'm brought into areas where you might have uh, kind of in a low economic situation. You have places where, you know, books may not be the first choice of an activity, you know, and that, you know, the educational goals for maybe the students aren't necessarily as high as you would see elsewhere. So I, because of that book, I end up getting into into the nice, squeaky, difficult parts, you know? The dirty zones, maybe, sometimes. And, and I like it, you know, because they're great. One of the things about these guys is they're really honest, and if they like the book, they'll come up to you and say so. So once, and I was in, it was a nice town in New Jersey, and... Um, this is a fairly typical kind of story. So I was speaking there, and I was speaking about this book, among other books. And there was a tough-looking kid in the back, you know, kind of had his head lowered down, looking up through his eyebrows the whole time. And then there was this young, sort of blonde, really enthusiastic person sitting next to him. And then there was this, you know, sort of middle-aged woman. And so finally I talked, and everybody left, and they didn't leave. So I kind of thought, you know, this is a little odd. So I was sort of walked down toward them, and I said, hello. And then the mother was like, stand up, and the, you know, the blonde stand up. So the guy gets up, and God, he was just, you know, he was a pretty strong kid. And so the mother says, tell him, tell him. So he kind of looks up, he finally looks me in the eye, and he goes, he goes, this is the first book I ever finished, you know. And the, the young woman was his reading teacher from school, and the mother was just so proud that he had finished a book and brought him down here. And the reading teacher was young and enthusiastic, you know, so she hadn't been worn out, you know. And, and he was there. And then he said, I would have given it to my friend to read, but he's in prison. I said, well, you know, we could send him. You know, we'll send him a copy. We'll take care of that, which we did. And so, but that kind of, you know, little story is just amazing to me to see to see this kid come forward and to have a book and then to hope you know to walk walk away you know thinking well maybe that's the first of many books that's really where we want to go so i see a lot of that with this book it's a it's a teen boy book that really seems to want to be you know the first book through the door <laughs>